Thank you for joining us online today. We at the house love to hear what God is doing in your life. And if you have a testimony, email that to us at amen at hotl.church. And if our house has impacted you in any way and you want to partner with us financially, please go to our website at hotl.church and click on the right top to give or text an amount uh, to 84321. Once again, thank you for being with us. Hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. I got the privilege this morning to, uh, to continue our, uh, our series, Better Together, on relationships. Um, if we've not met before, uh, my name is Joel Eklund. I'm the Generations Pastor here at House of the Lord, and I'm really, really excited to preach this message. If you're taking notes this morning, I'd like you to write down Christian Mingle. Christian Mingle. It's a little on the nose. It's a little on the nose. I'm going to talk about... Um, Romantic relationships this morning, Um, partially because I think that to a certain degree, um, can I can I just get really real with you this morning? Because I'm going to anyway, so (laughs) I hope I got your permission. Uh, I I really feel I really feel that uh, that a lot of times our, our our discipleship model we we leave out one of the most important factors. How many of you recognize that the most important decision that you will ever make? is saying yes to Jesus. Like, number one, that's the most important decision you'll ever make. Who your God is, is is, is ultimately the most important thing that defines you. How many of you recognize, though, that who you marry is the second most important decision you will ever make? See, we... We tend to be we tend to be really really systematic about how we how we how we how we save up to buy a house what we're looking for in a car like you know my dad is is a consummate researcher of like everything how many of you guys in the room here are researchers like you get this you get this idea in your mind that you're going to go buy a motorcycle or a truck or a boat and all of a sudden but you know by the time that you get to the the you know you get to the the sales office you know more about the model of vehicle that you're looking for than the person selling it and yet, we tend to treat relationships as though our moments don't matter. We jump blithely into relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship, hoping that everything just works out. How many of you would buy a car knowing absolutely nothing about it and just hope it all works out? No, that would be foolish, wouldn't it? You at least want to know that the engine is functional, right? Right? I, I'll tell you, I, I bought quite a few cars in my day, and, and I, I, don't, I really don't know a whole lot about you know, mechanical work, but if, if I'm taking a car on a test drive and I hear a knock in the engine, I return it immediately. So no thank you, this, this model seems to be defective. I'm about to get way into my message, so just, just come with me for a minute. How many of you recognize that, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. If you're married in the room this morning, don't check out on me. Here's why. We're going to talk a little bit about singleness today. We're going to talk about relationships. We're also going to talk about how you are going to have someone. Can can I tell you, my dad is an amazing watermelon picker. I'm going somewhere with this. Come with me. He's an amazing watermelon picker. I have never had a bad watermelon at my father's house. Here's why. Because my dad has some sort of like secret method of picking watermelons. Like he'll go to the store, he'll like thump it, and he'll like wait for like the right reverberation to come through. (laughs) For whatever reason, he simply knows how to pick watermelons. I go to the store, and I'm like, that one looks green and large. And then I get home with my watermelon, and it's mushy, and it's gross, and I think to myself, if only my father had taught me how to pick a watermelon. (laughs) Yo, here's where it gets real. Many of our children are really, really bad at picking relationships and people because we never taught them how. Come on, stop blaming your kid for being bad at picking their, picking their mate if you never taught them how to find the right watermelon. My dad picks on me a lot, yo. It's going to get real this morning. It's 
Can I tell you something we need to get better about in the church? We got to stop pressuring people into relationships. Oh, you're 28 and you're still single. Ooh. Ooh. I'm praying for you, girl. You got your eye on anybody? Oh, you're 16. Are you dating yet? Oh, you don't have a boyfriend? Ooh, girl. Is there something wrong? Are you okay? It's a constant pressure. Constant pressure. Can I tell you, this is not a goal. This right here should not be our goal. See, so many of us, because we view, we view this part of our lives, and if you're a man, picture yourself not in this or that. Well, it's just a visual. I couldn't find four mannequins. We picture, we see this picture and we say, not enough. We see this picture and we think, fulfillment. How many of you are aware that God is not just a God of the destination, he's a God of the journey? The goal of relationships, you know, I hear young people say this all the time, and not even just young people, but people that are, you know, getting into relationships a little older in life. They'll say things to me like, well, Pastor Joel, we're in a courtship, you know, and they say that because that's the really holy way to do relationships these days. (laughs) And they tell me, our goal is marriage. Friend, the point of relationships is not marriage, it's safety and wholeness. See, most of us, most of us are trying so hard to get from here to here that we miss everything in between that will actually help us to have real fulfillment here. I got I to tell somebody in the room today, you might be sitting here saying, Pastor Joel, why are we talking about singleness? I've got marriage issues. Can I propose to you that maybe you don't have a marriage issue, you have a singleness issue? You have an issue that should have been solved here, that got transported here, that is beginning to manifest as a marriage issue. Yet yeah, this is the big idea. Maybe your marriage problem is just a singleness issue in disguise. It's masquerading as a problem with your spouse. The reality is it's a problem right here. I got to tell somebody in the room this morning that marriage was not the first institution that God created. A lot of times we say that at weddings because it's a really fun thing to say. The first institution was singleness. The first thing that God did by default, by creating Adam with no Eve, he said that singleness is something that you have to go through to get to here. Quit trying to will your way out of it thinking that all of your problems are going to be solved when you put this wedding dress on or when you put that fly tuxedo on. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, and if you haven't, please crawl out from under the rock you've been living in, wherever you are, that's where you are? Wherever you go, that's where you are. You're, you're the same person. Look, if you're, if you're wanting to move down to Arizona to run from your problems, the problem is your problems are within you. You just packed them right up and you moved them down south into 115 degree weather. Great job. <laughs> We need to start putting some parameters on our singleness, not just on our dating relationships or our marriage. Listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to teach this morning from probably the most misunderstood, and I'm going to be be honest, one of the most, probably the, 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 the least popular passages of Scripture this morning. I'm probably not going to hear a lot of amens when I read this, but, but I, want you to, I want you to just come with me on this journey. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35. It says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord and how to please him. But the married man is anxious about worldly things and how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you, but to promote good order and to secure undivided devotion to the Lord. See, no amens. I want to give you a little bit of context here. 
Paul has what we call in the church the gift of singleness. Now, what, what that means, <laughs> for those of you in the room who are single, and like, I remember, I remember as, I, as I started getting older and I was, you know, waiting on, you know, waiting on the right person, um, I, I, I would hear, I'd hear youth pastors and, you know, and, and, and senior leaders talk about the gift of singleness, and I remember asking, you know, saying, Lord, if I have the gift of singleness, I give it back to you. <laughs> I give it back to you. I sacrifice it as a pure offering. <laughs> Look. Paul had the gift of singleness. What that meant is he did not understand the urge to marry. He didn't care. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7, he even says, this isn't from the Lord, this is just from, from, from my own wisdom. When we read this passage of Scripture, we have to remind ourselves that even though Paul is literally saying it's better to stay unmarried if you have the gift of singleness, that doesn't mean that it's literally buried, better to stay unmarried. What he's saying what he's saying is, is that most of us, like I was talking about earlier, have made this the goal of our lives, when the reality is the goal of our life is to please the Lord primarily and utmost. Amen. Paul, in this passage of Scripture, was addressing two issues. At that particular point in time, the church was experiencing a deep, deep level of persecution. What he was saying was he's saying, if you can get away with it, if, 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 you can, if you can stay unmarried and be fine, it would literally be better just in case you, you know, get killed then you won't have to worry about the wife or the children that you leave behind. So that's part of our context. And the second one, which is probably a little bit more appropriate for us, is that marriage won't fix you. Only Jesus can. How many of you are aware that there's no power to save in marriage? I'm going to be real with you. Some of us got married out of convenience. We thought to ourselves, well, it's okay. My lust problem will cease when I can have sex all the time. My money issues will change when I have a spouse who also works and also has an income. My, inse oh, here's <laughs> My insecurity issue will go away when I have a spouse who will love me with everything they've got all the time. Somebody just got attacked. <laughs> when I get a spouse, I'll feel like I'm enough because mom and dad will stop nagging me about the grandkids. <laughs> and Grammy will stop thinking maybe there's something wrong with me. Your problems are not going to go away just because you get married. So our culture has this, you know, has this particular theme and philosophy that, you know, you, you hear it a lot. I'm just, I'm just a half person looking for my other half. <laughs> Can I tell you that, that the math of the kingdom is a little bit different than the world's math? One half person plus one half person does not create one whole person. One half person plus one half person equals double the problems. There's, there's an old saying that says, uh, a problem shared is a problem doubled. Oftentimes, that's exactly what happens when mar with marriage when you didn't learn the lesson of singleness. When you didn't take the opportunity when you could to work on the inside. You get into marriage and you find that rather than your problems being minimized, they actually get amplified. we got to stop treating marriage like evangelism. What I mean by that is, like I said before, marriage can't save you. A lot, of us, a lot of us are going after a spouse largely because we've got to fix our issues. We've got to fix our problems. i got to remind the church this morning, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're in a dating relationship, whether you're engaged, whether you're courting, whatever you're doing, remind yourself that only Jesus can change you. I feel like I'm a pretty persuasive person. Like, I'm pretty, I'm just going to be honest, I'm pretty good at talking. And, I, and when my wife and I sit down and she's got an issue, like, I have to be careful because sometimes when I sit down with my wife and she's got a problem, I, I, I think it's roll up the sleeves time instead of just grab a coffee and listen time. 
no matter how persuasive I am, I've recognized that I can't fix her. Well, some, some man in the room just needed to hear that. You can't fix your wife, bro. And in fact, the more you try, the worse things are getting. Am I right? Yeah. This isn't even in my notes. I just got to let you know that as a husband, your primary responsibility is not to try and fix your wife. It's to point her to Jesus. Man, you're... We're we're going so far out of our way to you know to, to, to fix everything like you 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 know the hole in your wife's heart is actually just like the hole in your drywall that somehow you can you can just you know get the right tools out and everything's going to work itself out fine but you simply don't have the tools necessary to do what needs to be done you got to call a professional man Genesis two I'm going to go three verses. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. Uh, this is verses uh, 8, 15, and 18. And the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and to work it and keep it. And then the Lord said, and this is, this is a few verses later. So here Adam has been created. He's been created in the wilderness. He's been put into the garden. God put him to work. He was, he, he was doing what he was called to do. And then in verse 18, it says this. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. How many of you believe that God just simply forgot? Like it just occurred to him in that moment that what Adam really needed was a partner. No, he specifically put Adam in there first because he knew that Adam needed to learn how to be okay by himself. Okay, here's the big idea. You're always going to be better together, but you're going to have to learn to be good on your own. You'll always be better together, but you're going to have to learn to be good on your own. Can I tell you, when you're, when you're talking to your kids about relationships, rather than showing them how to find the right person, although that's, a, that's an incredible trait, like I said, they need to learn how to pick watermelons. you got to remind them, you're fine just the way you are. You're a strong, independent woman. You don't need a man. That's what I'm telling my girl until she's 25. (laughs) You weren't born for marriage. You were born for a relationship with God and finding wholeness in him. We got to stop seeing, we got to, church, we got to stop seeing singleness as a problem and start seeing it as an enormous blessing. Can I tell you, as a single person, you will never have more time to serve the Lord than you do right now. Never. You'll never have more time for undevoted devotion to God. You'll never have more time and less responsibility to work on yourself. See your season of singleness as a blessing rather than a curse, and you'll actually begin to walk in the blessing of it. See, so many of us, like I said, we're trying to get out of our, out of our season of singleness as quickly as possible, that we're not developing, we're not developing, for lack of a better term, the relational muscles to actually make our marriage successful. And you wonder why people say, oh, the first year of marriage is so hard. You know why? It's because people that people that people that walk through their singleness as though it was just you know it was just another road, it was another place to get to the destination, and they didn't look at it from a very purposeful perspective. They didn't learn what they needed to, and then all of a sudden they recognize how many of you understand that marriage is different than dating. Like you woke up the next morning. I mean, you know, you know, your tux is still over in the corner. You know, I, I don't know what women do with their dress. My wife's dress sort of just disappeared. <laughs> Probably went into a closet somewhere. And it felt, it felt almost like, oh man, I married a different person. Then I start thinking of like the story of, you know, of, of, of Jacob and Leah, then Jacob and Rachel. And I'm like, what happened to my Rachel? <laughs> My wife's running the live stream. Hi, babe. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Can I be real with you, though? If there's any great regret I have about being a husband, it's that I was not purposeful in my singleness at all. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this message on the, on the other side of, of, of a, a, quite a few years early on in our marriage of really having to work on ourselves because we were so busy staring longingly into each other's eyes <laughs> that we didn't spend enough time looking deeply here. Hey, Christian, you want to grow? Introspection is going to be a really key skill for you. Man, so many of us are so good at looking at other people and immediately diagnosing all of their issues. But we look at ourselves and we're like, nah, man, I'm good. Grace of God. Man, you're not. Okay. Don't be blind to what's right here, especially when you can see it all around you. You are not immune. I, I have to tell people this because I really feel like there's something in us that we, we you know, we, we demand perfection from, from other people, but we, we demand and, and expect grace for ourselves. But I, I got to remind you, you are not immune to real issues. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? All right. Okay. Quit looking for somebody to marry and become someone you would marry. Like, okay, I got to ask you, would you marry you? I mean, like, most of us, could, most married people in the room, married people in the room this morning, you knew exactly what I'm talking about. Like, when you were, you were at that moment, mostly men, because all your, you know, your wives are perfect. But there was that moment where she's about to say, I do, and you're just like... Yes! I can't believe it! She fell for it! <laughs> I mean, come on, would you marry you? Man, it's so it's it's really easy. It's really it's really easy for us to get into this pattern of saying, man, I need to find the right person. Without ever asking ourselves the question, am I the right person? Is this the right moment for me? Yeah. Quit looking to get out of your season when there's still a lot of stuff that you need to work on before you get into the next one. Don't make your deficiencies as a person your spouse's problem. Wow. Whew. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. This actually, I'm going to be honest with you, this is going to be a pretty short message today. Because I figured it was going to be a little hard-hitting. So you can go talk to Pastor Jeff afterwards. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody say, as yourself. Like you like yourself. Can I ask you a question? Do you like you? How do you... Okay. You're doing your future spouse a disservice if you haven't learned how to love you yet. If you haven't, if you haven't found out what self-care looks like for you, don't get married yet, please. If you have not figured out... <coughs> If you've not figured out what self-care for you looks like yet, how to, how, to, how to fill your own tank, how to be your own best friend, if you haven't figured that out yet, please don't get married yet. That is a key life skill, by the way. Whether you're an introvert, whether you're an extrovert, whether you're, you know, whether you're an Enneagram 3 or you're a 6 or you're a 2, most of you don't know what I'm talking about. For those of you who do, just come with me. Whatever it is that your personality, you have got to figure out how to feed yourself. In the same way that as a believer, I can, I can stand up here on a Sunday morning and, and I, can, I can give you something to chew on. I can give you one meal, but you got to figure out how to give yourself some meals during the week or you're going to starve to death. If church is the only place where you're getting any input from the Holy Spirit, we got a real problem. 
We got a real discipleship issue. But if you can't figure out how to take care of yourself, you got a real life issue. Don't visit that on a spouse. Okay, I got to talk about dating for a hot minute. You ready for it? Okay. Okay, first bullet point. Dating is not biblical. Stop it. <laughs> I'm not saying stop dating. I'm just saying stop trying to justify it, okay? There's nothing in the scriptures that we could ever look at and say, oh, yeah, that right there, dating. Because especially, especially when the Bible was written, like relationships were done so differently. It wasn't necessarily about love. It was about procreation. They just assumed that when you operated like love is supposed to operate, you would eventually have the feelings of love. What do I mean by that? How many recognize that 1 Corinthians 13, where it goes through, you know, love is patient, love is kind. What it's saying is love looks like something. It actually has attributes more than just, ooh, the feels. Whether you recognize this or not, most of you did not love your spouse when you got married. Because most of us, Many of us, perhaps, never had to actually go through a lot of the things that love is. Yeah, we were maybe patient. We might have been kind. But were we entirely self-sacrificing? Did we have to believe even when it seemed like there was nothing to believe in? Did we have to hope beyond hope? Did we ever find ourselves in a position where we had to make sure that we never gave up? Not usually. Can I be frank with you and say that I don't know that I really loved Jesus when I first said yes to him? I liked him. I was pretty happy about the whole salvation thing. That was nice. That was good. You know, I, I, like, you know, I like the destination. Love where I'm going. Really like the benefits of this. But when I had to actually start practicing love, that's when you fall in love. You recognize it's worth this. It's worth this. It's worth this. Most of us have mistaken passion for love, and we've just said, oh, I'm so deeply passionate about you, I must be in love. No, friend, come on, let's be real. A lot of times, what we're in is lust, or we're in loneliness. We're, we're practicing loneliness. Can I tell you what a date should be? A date should be an interview. How many in here have ever interviewed someone? Do you give a bad candidate a second interview? No, because they're a bad candidate. They showed up late. They treated you like you didn't matter. They made you feel like <laughs> they made you feel like you were, they, they, you, they weren't being added, being added to your company. That they were they were bringing something really great to you, and so it wasn't really worth their time. There's a, there's a saying in business. That goes like this, it says, never hire out of desperation. You'll always regret it. Don't hire because you need a position filled. Hire the right person. So many of us are so steeped in loneliness that we're willing to give someone a second interview because we're lonely, not because they're the right person. Like I said before, the goal of dating or courtship or whatever it is that, that looks like for you is not marriage. It's safety in your journey. You know, I, I, I honestly believe that God wants people to be happy, but more than happiness, he's looking for holiness. Stop treating your life as though your moments don't matter. Time is the most valuable commodity that you have. And it's the only thing you can't get more of. Stop wasting it on people and things that feel like short-term solutions, but are actually creating more long-term problems. <coughs> Friend, I gotta, I gotta tell somebody in the room this morning, I got to tell somebody in the room this morning that 
the cure for your sexual brokenness is not more sex. Any more than the, you know, the cure for a heroin addict is more heroin. It's only making your life worse. Like, I mean, guys, we could, we could sit here for the next, you know, 30 or 40 minutes and I could, I could go through where the scripture talks about, you know, flee youthful lusts and, you know, all these kinds of things. But I think a lot of times what we don't do is we don't tell people how damaging and how destructive sexual immorality can be. You know, one of the most endearing things, one of the most endearing things in the world is seeing a child play with a ball in a yard. Like, I see my kids play, and, and it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. I can stop and watch them have fun, and I gain enjoyment from it. Amen. But interestingly enough, if you put that same child and that same ball in the street, it goes from being endearing to crisis in a heartbeat. My, my little girl, is a, uh, she's a runner. Like, I don't mean marathons. I mean, like, if she, whatever, whatever the boundary is, she finds the boundary and sprints past it. And about, um, I don't know, it was, probably, it was probably about six or eight months ago. It was during the summer. Um, is it six or eight months ago now? I don't even know. This winter's been really long. <laughs> anyway, um, Avery was outside on the porch, and she was, she was playing, and... Um, and I, I literally, I turned, it's like I turned, I turned around for like one minute to like do something in the kitchen. And like the next thing I know, I look out the window and in like full technicolor, I'm watching my little girl sprint down our street that's right by the hospital and people fly up that street like 35 miles an hour because I don't know, emergencies or something. <laughs> and I immediately stopped because all of a sudden, she had run past the boundaries into an area that she didn't recognize was super dangerous. But I knew it. Look, you gotta, you gotta recognize that boundaries are there for your protection. They're there so that you don't run into a danger zone. And I'm, I'm telling you, sexual immorality is a danger zone for you. It is not going to help you. Having sex with some random person because you're having a really, really rough week or month or series of months, it might feel great for the moment, but all it's doing is it's producing another cut in your spirit, it's producing another cut in your heart, it's producing another break in you that only God can fix that issue. We gotta remind ourselves the boundaries are there for our protection. There's no parent that creates rules because they're cruel. But maybe I'll do this, say this another way. There's no good parent that creates rules because they're cruel. You create rules because you recognize that even if my kid cannot understand the reason they can't play in the street, they can't play in the street. Ladies, you are hardwired, hardwired for safety, security, and permanence. It's why, it's why, to a certain degree, the sexual revolution is not, it's simply not working for women. You know, they were told that, that the freedom to have, you know, multiple partners and you do all these things was going to make their lives better. But actually what we're seeing is that more often than not, in fact, in huge statistical realities, women are far less happier than they used to be. They're using far more... Uh, mood enhancing drugs because it seems like over the past 40 or 50 years our whole society has been steeped in depression. More sex isn't making it better. And I gotta tell you more than that because I've seen this happen so many times. Just getting married to a person you're having sex with to make everything great is not going to help you. We haven't, even, we haven't even asked if they're the right person. You know, I, I've, I've, seen people, I've seen people marry, you know, either because they, you know, they had a child out of wedlock or, you know, or any number of things. And, and if you didn't marry the right person, all you did was you quadrupled the problem. Because you didn't ascertain whether or not this was a person that you could 
I'm not saying wanted to, could spend the rest of your life with. Look, I, I firmly believe that with Jesus, anything can work. Anything can work. God can fix any broken machine. He can fix any broken marriage. He can fix any broken heart. But I can tell you that it would be better for us Rather than trying to fix something that's broken, if we just stopped and asked ourselves, do we want God to have to rescue us? Or maybe we just recognize the boundaries that are set up in the beginning. Whether your issue is in singleness, dating, or marriage, I've got one big solution for you. Here's the big idea. Quit focusing on the problem and turn to the solution. Genesis 24, 2-4. I love this story. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. When I first read that as a boy, I was like, yikes, what does that mean? Um, It was just a way of swearing, not swearing, Kurt, come come with me. "That That I make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among who I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Here's a problem. Abraham's family wasn't exactly a massive group of people. You ever ask yourself the question, or, you know, or it's come across you know, your mind or, you know, or, or whatever, you know, living in a small town, who would I ever marry here? Now, I want, you to, I want you to macro that problem and, and, and maybe imagine that, that in a pool of, you know, of, of 10 eligible women, Abraham had just narrowed that down to maybe one or two people that his son was going to have to marry. Genesis 24, 62 to 63, this is the end of the story. It says, now Isaac had returned... From uh, Beer Le Hoy Roy. I, that's, I totally nailed that, yo. <laughs> <laughs> and Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. I want you to just grab hold of this. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, behold, there were camels coming. And this is where you know, his, he meets his wife. Isaac's problem was his future wasn't really in his hands. How many of you have ever felt like that? Like your future is not your own. You're not really sure where to go from here. What was his solution? He had no control. All he had, that word meditate, was he went up to pray. Instead of over-focusing on his problem, maybe even getting mad at his father for forcing him into that situation... He said, I'm going to focus on the Lord in this time. He had no clue that literally that very night, his wife was going to be revealed. We had no clue. All he had was the knowledge that God was good, that God was for him, and God had promised to help him. Look, some of us, can can I be real honest? Some of us are cutting God completely out of the relationship process, and we're just kind of hoping that he'll bless our decisions. Okay, friend, if you will, I mean, if you're going to, how many, maybe I'll ask this question. How many of you prayed before you bought your first house and asked the Lord, oh God, if this is not the right thing, please tell me. If there's going to be black mold, you know, under the house, please let me know. As big a decision as buying a house is, you recognize that you can always sell the house and buy another one, right? Right? So many of us, what we're doing is we're finding a person and then we're saying, oh God, please bless this. Rather than reminding ourselves, God, my relationship status is in your hands, not Facebook's. Yikes. Even I got convicted by that. James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. i got, I got to remind you that there is nothing that the wisdom of heaven can't overcome. 
God does not withhold answers from people when they ask the right questions. Come on, let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you that whatever, whatever stage of relationship we're in, whether we're, whether we're in a season of singleness, whether we're, whether we're actively uh, entering into courtships or dating, or whether we're, you know, we got an available sign strapped around our neck, whether, we're, whether we've been married for five years or 10 years or 20 or 30 or maybe even 40, I thank you that your wisdom can still overcome every issue that we deal with. And all we have to do is ask. I love, the way that the, I love the way that your word says it. It says that he will give generously and without reproach. You're not going to make fun of us for not knowing what we don't know. You don't mock us for not understanding which way we're supposed to go. Rather, you, 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 you gleefully and gladly bring us into places where we can experience your blessing. God, I pray, this, I pray this morning over those that are in a season of singleness, whether they're right here in this room, whether they're part of our online community. Lord, I pray that we would begin to see this season not as a curse, but as a blessing. Not as a time where we, we've got to get out of this thing as fast as possible, but rather that we begin to ask ourselves the hard questions like, God, what, can I, what, what, what needs to change in me? What needs to change in me so that when I come into a relationship, when I come into marriage, I can, I can give the full measure of blessing to my spouse. What can I, what can I change within me? For those of us who are, who are in dating or, or, or courtships or what have you, Lord, I pray that we remind ourselves that our goal is not marriage, it's wholeness and it's safety. We don't want to be people that are limping to the altar. We want to find the right person, not just any person. And God, over married people in the room this morning, Lord, I pray that we would, be, we would remind ourselves, we would remind ourselves that any issue can be fixed. Any issue can be fixed. Any problem, anything that we're dealing with, you can take it you can remake it. You can reform it. Lord, we trust you. We trust you. Come on. As a people this morning, can we just, can we remind ourselves that we really do trust the Lord? We really do trust what he can do in our lives. We really do trust that you can fix it. I, I just, I feel like there's some, there, there's some people in the room that, 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 are, that, that are in some marriages that you've just lost hope. It's not that you've lost desire. It's that you don't know how it's supposed to get fixed. And because of that, there's something in you that's starting to die. I feel like the Lord wants to, wants to, to touch your life right now, to renew your hope, to renew the gladness in your spirit and to renew your drive. Don't give up. Come on, if that's you this morning, and you, you, need, you need some hope to be re-injected into your relationship. You need some hope to be re-injected into your covenant. If that's you today, I want you to lift your hand. I'm going to pray with you right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you today that you are the God of all hope. Lord, I pray for those that are just saying, God, we, we need something. Even, even if there's some, there's some, I feel like there's some people in the room, you, you didn't respond because you didn't want to make your, your spouse feel bad. I, I believe God's going to honor that this morning. Lord, I pray that every person this morning that in their heart is saying, I need a refilling of hope. I, I, I need to have my drive refilled. I need to have, I need to have the gladness of my relationship and, and, and covenant refilled. Lord, I pray right now that your hope would begin to fall in this place. Jesus mighty name.